Thank you so much, Aji, uh, for the invitation, for the kind introduction that uh, grew quite a bit from the, the three sentences I had given you. So let me tell you first what I will not tell you today. I am not going to focus on the human part of this story. I'll be talking about that on Thursday. So you have a completely different lecture on Thursday if you, if you care to attend the public lecture. What I will tell you about today is um, on the work that um, I've been doing in my lab and with my collaborators for the last 15 years by now, and how that's come to change my view of brain evolution in particular, and with I think implications for how we think about evolution as a, as a whole, and I'll tell you why. And, and that's, that starts with, that, um, with those two words over there, whatever works. That's how I've come to think of biology, and that's how I think about brain evolution more and more. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll spend the next 15 minutes or so telling you the reasons why I think that's the, that's the case. But essentially, the, the bottom line is I'll show you data that make it pretty obvious, I think, that there are many different ways to put a brain together. And obviously, all of them are equally su successful, given that all of those brains and their animals are still alive. So let me start with this. Um, this is, in one word, my main research interest. It's diversity. How come? brains can be so immensely diverse, starting with variation in size from the tiniest little mammalian brains to the largest uh, whale brain you can find. There's, if, you, if you look around enough, you see that uh, at the same time that there is enormous diversity, there is also a pattern behind that diversity. For instance, you can look at any of these brains and you instantly recognize that it's some form of a mammalian brain. It's not a bird brain. It's not an invertebrate brain. Um, now, behind that diversity, and ever since Darwin um, pushed the idea that there is adaptation, that every single organism is adapted, there's I think neuroscience and most biological sciences have been working under this main uh, conception, this, 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 may, this main idea, that everything that exists, all forms of life, have been optimized by natural selection. So whatever brain you have, however brains are made, that must be an ideal way of putting a brain and a body together. And that must be the result of natural selection. And that made all the more sense because for a very long time until um, that, that certainly was the, the, the state of things when I first became interested in understanding brain diversity and, and evolution, there was this idea that all brains were built the same way. At the very least, all mammalian brains were built the same way. And what I mean by built the same way was that a certain set of very simple rules applied. Let me walk you through those rules. The first one is that lar the, the larger an animal becomes, the larger its brain becomes, um, which can be rephrased, as it often was, by the larger an animal becomes, the larger a brain that animal needs. Presumably, as a larger body requires more computational power, requires more neurons as basic information processing units to um, organize, to pattern all the, the activity of the body, to operate the, the body, if you will. So you see that there is enormous variation over nine orders of magnitude in brain size, and there's even more variation in the size of the, of the body. What that means is that larger animals tend to have larger brains, yes, but not as rapidly as the, the, the body increases, so the relative size of the brain 
um, actually decreases the larger the, the animal is. And by the way, it's compared to this relationship only that the human brain appears to be extraordinary, literally, as in out of the ordinary, out of what you would expect. But I'll, I'll come back to that story on Thursday. All right, so not only larger bodies are presumably um, accompanied necessarily by larger brains, those larger brains are all built the same way, meaning with more neurons that also become larger neurons. If anything, simply for the fact that as you add neurons to a brain, that that's the, the brain structure naturally increases in size, and that means that even if it's just the axon fiber of the neuron that changes, it will necessarily have to increase um, if it still connects to the other side, let's say, of the brain, and that gives you a bigger neuron. Um, but that's not all that there is to the idea. The, the general expectation has um, always been that uh, as you get more neurons, neurons also become larger, not just in, in the size of the soma, but also all the dendr dendritic arbors and the the axonal arbors as well. So the result is that when you compare a larger brain to a smaller brain, you would always find lower densities of neurons in the bigger brain, lower densities as a consequence of neurons being, being bigger. So that's the expectation, that the bigger a brain is, the lowest the density of neurons should be, and also that if you, wait, if you were to take two brains of a similar size or two cortices of a similar size, they should be made of similar numbers of neurons, and therefore you would expect the owners of those two cortices or two brains to have similar information processing or cognitive capabilities. Um, Along the same lines, if you compare bird brains now to mammalian brains, you realize that these are drawn to scale. You realize that uh, bird brains are generally tiny. They're the biggest bird brain there is is an ostrich brain, and it's about this big. Uh, and a lot of it is the, the, the cerebellum. The most brains, most bird brains are only about this big, so really not much bigger than a rat brain which is why bird brain became something that you could call somebody that you didn't really like and you wanted to insult. Um, and you might want to hold on that insult. I'll show you in, in just a bit how that's, uh, it's really quite the opposite. If you want to insult somebody, call them a mammal. Um, the, the other general concept was that brain evolution happens uniformly across all different parts of the brain. So as one part of the brain scales up, other parts of the brain also scale up. That was the, the view of linked regularities or, or concerted evolution that was put forward by Barbara Finley about 20 years ago. And, um, but you can see that uh, while most other parts of the, of the brain seem to have each, what you see here, each dot is one species, indicating the relative size of that, um, of that structure. You see that uh, when you look over these several orders of magnitude, it does appear that um, each of these parts of the brain increase in tandem, so they increase together. It's only the neocortex that scales that increases in size faster than everybody else. So this has been one very dominant view in, of uh, brain evolution, that evolution has been about cortical expansion above all things. And even if you do have different uh, variations in the, in the relative size of the other brain structures, like um, uh, this study in 2001, proposed, you still see that the neocortex, the part in blue here, it, uh, it takes, it occupies a bigger and bigger fraction of the entire tel telencephalon across species as the overall size of the brain increases, which is here from left to right. So you have cortical expansion and also that cortex, when you look within that cortex, that cortex was supposed to be fairly uniform. Uniform in that 
um, once it was realized by Vernon Mountcastle that um, the, you do have, uh, the cortex is organized in columns, um, th about 30 years, 20 years later, Rockwell and his, his colleagues did a few counts of how many neurons you find in a micrograph underneath the surface of a cortex in a few different species. And you see the numbers here. They, they found what appeared to be a fairly reasonably constant number of neurons underneath that surface in what you have, what you see here are these five species only, mouse, rat, cat, monkey, and man. Um, I'll point out to you in a bit how come if you choose these, if you get these five species just because they happen to be the ones that are handy to, to get, you would certainly think that. Um, but the, the point is, based on these numbers of what was apparently a constant number of neurons underneath a square micrometer of cortical surface, the idea became that uh, since you have this enormous variation in surface area of the cortex, but very little variation in thickness across all mammalian species that you could look at, all that happened to the cortex in evolution, as this enormous expansion of the cortex in evolution, must have been sideways expansion of the cortex. So essentially just adding more of those columns, more of uh, Mountcastle's columns to the cortex sideways as ever as the number of neurons per module remained the same, which was, of course, a, a, a wonderful thing for computational scientists because you could, you had uh, apparently biology's blessing to consider that cortices are all the same, a cortex is, is a cortex is a cortex, so you can really just make it expand sideways, just make it vary in your models with more or fewer um, units, so columns. And that's exactly what Pascal Rakish did in the late 80s. He proposed this really, really um, influential view of the, the he, that he called the radio unit hypothesis, which um, meant ex proposed exactly that, that there's a radio unit to forming the cortex. It's a number of neurons that you get from one original progenitor in the ventricular zone. And Evolution happens, at least for the cortex, as the number of progenitor cells that, forms, that form the cortex varies. As it varies, you get this lateral expansion of the cortex, and each of those progenitor cells goes on to form a constant number of neurons, and there you have an expanded cortex. That also happens to fold, either as a... Um, and here's where, um, if you look up the, the, the literature, some people would argue that folding, the, so what you see here is that the larger, say, a primate cortex is, the more folded its surface, uh, you find that its surface is. Um, and that also happens in, in other clades of mammals, even though the folding looks different um, on the surface, you see that uh, a larger cortex is always more folded or almost always more folded in, than a smaller cortex. So one, everybody seemed to agree there was this consensus that that had to do with larger cortices being made of more neurons. The, the disagreement, but this was veiled disagreement, was in how um, that would happen. Some people saw the folding as a, as a direct and inevitable consequence of having more neurons form that cortex, if so expand that, uh, the cortical sheet. M very much like, um, well, imagine that you just put your, your hand towel in the laundry hamper and that towel started growing inside that laundry hamper. The only way it can grow is by folding. It's, that's the only way it's going to fit in that laundry hamper. So that was very much one view. Um, the, so you can see that as a consequence of having more neurons or as a selected for manner to allow more neurons to fit inside the, the, the cortex. So one way or another, cause or consequence of having more, more neurons, folding came with having more neurons in the cortex. 
which, by the way, also had an optimized arrangement of um, volume in of, of the volume of its circuitry components between gray matter and white matter. You can find Nietzsche Sklovsky's papers, for instance, that make this beautiful argument that um, the optimal way to build a cortex with, that, with elements that are connected across long distances is to have gray matter and white matter segregated. And uh, you see, if you, if you look in nature, you see that um, the bigger a brain becomes, the relatively bigger the white matter becomes. So cortical white matter in a human brain certainly appears to be pretty large, but if you look at this relationship between the volume of the white matter and the volume of the gray matter across a wide range of species, um, you see that there is a pattern. There is some order behind that. Humans, by the way, are right here. So we have the volume of white matter that you could expect for a generic mammal of our um, gray matter volume. But there's more to this story. Uh, Zang and Sejnovsky, two computational neuroscientists, used this relationship um, to inform theory that um, they argued could explain how cortical circuitry is optimized, how the volume of the cortex is optimized and might uh, arise. I'm, reading what they wrote in their abstract might arise naturally as a consequence of that local uniformity of the cortex and the requirement for a compact arrangement of long axonal fibers. So again, something that was selected for. So there's a requirement and there's a evolution caters to that requirement. But I realized when I started reading about um, reading in this, this field, and I, I guess um, to my, I had a major disadvantage that in a way came to my advantage. I never had any training in this area. Like um, Avi Adi said, I, I trained in computational neuroscience or uh, the biological part of computational neuroscience with Wolf Zenger. Um, not in neuroanatomy. So what happened was that I had to go dig the literature for the original papers. Why did people say that the cortex is always built the same way, that uh, neurons get bigger, that two cortices of the same size have similar numbers of neurons, that a cortex with more neurons is always more folded and a cortex becomes more folded as and only as it gains more neurons. I realized that a number of these concepts that made so much sense and that built this one neat, tidy story very nicely, um, they were actually mostly intuitions. There were a little bit of data here and there, data on a few neuronal densities in some cortices, for instance, certainly data on how folded cortices are, but nobody knew how many neurons different brains of different species had. Nobody knew if a more folded cortex really had more neurons than a less folded cortex. Um, so either they were intuitions or maybe even worse, they were what uh, retrospectively we can call self-fulfilling prophecies that were based on this assumption that all animals should scale the same way. And it, it's quite natural because if, if you have that assumption and you could have that assumption simply by looking at diversity, at brain diversity across this enormous range of variation in the whole of life, when you look at variation across several orders of magnitude, um, changes appear very diluted. All, the only thing that catches the eye really is the main pattern. So yes, if you assume that all species are made the same and you then make all your, your comparisons, all your analysis like Zeng and Sejnovsky did looking at white matter in relationship to gray matter, if you put them all together and treat them as one, Yes, you can always fit one line. You can always make an argument that you can predict uh, patterns for everyone with the same, with the same one mathematical relationship. Um, 
So having realized that, I thought that um, I think I actually know how to count cells. And I came up with a method that really what to me, uh, what I call it is making brain soup, but of course, no editor would let me publish a method with that name, so we had to give a, a, a more pompous name, and that's the isotropic fractionator. But really what it is, is you take fixed brain tissue and you turn it into soup. And it goes like this. You start with uh, fixed tissue, so you have your neurons in yellow here, the other cells in the tissue in green. You grind it in a, a, a glass homogenizer. It's really a, it's a standard tool in biochemical biochemistry labs. It's a mortar and pestle in a, in a long tube version. And what the detergent does is it dissolves the cell membranes, but not the nuclear membranes, because of the fixation. So the nuclear membrane is so rich in proteins that the fixation binds them all together, and it becomes virtually impossible to destroy the nuclei, even as you destroy the cell membranes. And I've tried. I've tried to destroy the nuclei on purpose, and I couldn't dissolve them, even in 20% SDS. Um, that helps because once you dissolve all the cell membranes, what you've essentially done is dissolve away of the source of heterogeneity in the building of the tissue of the, of the brain. So whereas uh, counting cells in, in original organized brain tissue is very hard because the densities, the distribution of neurons is highly heterogeneous across different parts, once you've turned it into soup, what you have now is a volume that contains all those nuclei. And because it's a liquid, you can just swirl that and turn it into um, a homogeneous volume of which you can take just four or five aliquots, 10 microliter aliquots. It doesn't matter how many you take. It doesn't matter from what part of the tube you take them if the tube, if the solution is homogeneous or the proper term is isotropic because it's, there's particles, there's suspension really. Then any aliquot will be a, rep a good representative of the whole and you can go to the microscope and count that. So let me give you a more real life example of what this looks like. You start with a brain. You can dissect it into the parts of interest to you, and these are the parts I'll be talking about today. There's the cerebral cortex, there's the cerebellum, and there's the rest, a very anatomically appropriate denomination, I know, um, but it'll do for today. The, once you've taken your region of interest, anything that can be dissected can be worked with, then you you can chop it, you, you can separate it finely, for instance, into gray and white matter. You chop that tissue, you grind it, and that gives you soup. It really looks like soup. Actually, my students tell me that it looks like, like unfiltered apple juice, and I've ruined it for them. Um, so you see that the nuclei are, are sedimented there in the, the tubes they deposit, just because they're heavy, so you can just tilt the tube several times. That gets the nuclei distributed evenly in the suspension, and then you take a few samples labeled with DAPI, and you go to the microscope, and this is what you see. Because the tissue was fixed in the original, um, in situ, nuclear proportions, nuclear size, nuclear shape are all maintained, they're all preserved. So if you have information, if, if you know how to distinguish your nuclear type of, uh, of interest, you can use that information. Or else, in well, first you get a, a total count, count of how many nuclei you had in the suspension by just counting representative sample, samples under the microscope. All that takes is 10 minutes. And in a couple more hours, you can use antibodies to identify what fraction of all those nuclei were, for instance, neurons. So this is what uh, the, the data that I'll be showing you today are all based on. It's the expression of nu n, which for our purposes can be considered a universal and exclusive marker of neurons in the brain. All right, so we have a method. Now, what do we apply it to? Well, if the interest is studying diversity, then just counting cells in 
mice and rats and monkeys and humans won't do. And I was very, I, I'm very fortunate to um, have been able to um, enlist uh, quite a few highly engaged collaborators, the Paul Menger in South Africa, John Kaz at Vanderbilt, um, working on primates, the, and uh, Pavel Niemic in the Czech Republic working on birds, and that allowed us to study literally dozens of species uh, that belong to different clades, to different groups of mammals. So you have primates here in red, and I'll, I'm, I've color-coded the data, so I'll, I'll always show you data uh, with the same color. So you always see primates in red, rodents in green, you have marsupials, aphrotherians in blue, including the elephant. Then you have um, eulipotiflans, so tiny little shrews and moles, carnivorans, and artodactyls, so large, um, even-toed ungulates. And quite a few species of birds also, especially songbirds and parrots. So we have sampled at a large diversity of, of species and we've also taken care to gather systematically data on the morphology or on the morphometry of the cortex of these the, the various mammalian species so that we could describe diversity we could describe that cortical diversity and examine how it varies if it varies systematically at all with the number of neurons across species so here you have a section through a hemisphere of a giraffe um, brain, and we define the, the cortical volume as, well, first you have the total volume of the cortex that is subdivided into gray matter and white matter, but remember that the volume that you find in the white matter is still composed by neurons. It's just that it's the axons of the neurons whose cell bodies are mostly here in the cerebral cortex. Um, so you have the volume of those two different components, you have the ratio between gray and white matter, you have the surface area in blue here, the total surface area of the cortex, the peel surface area, in yellow, just the exposed, so the equivalent exposed surface of the cortex, just think that you've saran wrapped an entire brain, that exposed surface area is one thing but there's uh, the actual total surface area may be much bigger than that. And now dividing the total mass of the cortex by the number of neurons, you get an estimate of the density of neurons in the tissue. And the inverse of density is an, uh, an estimate of the average size of the neurons. And you get that the, the inverse of the, the density is an, uh, is an estimate of the average size of the, of the neurons. And we can do that because something that I will not be telling you in, in detail today is that when you look at the density of the non-neuronal cells in the brain, that is essentially constant across all species that we've looked at across all different parts of the brain, which means that the only variation that you have, really, the, the, ma the, the source of variation in brain tissue composition is really the number of neurons and the average size of the neurons. So what do we find? We find that um, a larger cortex does not necessarily have more neurons than a smaller cortex. For instance, here you see a giraffe cortex. It's much larger than a macaque monkey. Uh, cortex, but it still has just about as many neurons, 1.6, 1.7 billion neurons. And so, in fact, um, a larger cortex can actually have even fewer neurons than a smaller cortex. That's the example of an, an elephant cortex compared to ours. The elephant brain is the size of my entire forearm. The elephant cortex is twice the size of a human cortex. But it only has about one-third as many neurons as the human cortex does. Um, so you could ask the question, well, maybe that's, that's it. That's the evidence that shows that humans are really special. Humans have this cortex that uh, concentrates a huge number of neurons that would not fit in any other cortex. Um, in a way, yes, but if you go systematically about it, and if you do a systematic analysis of this relationship between 
the size of the cerebral cortex, so in mass here, and the number of neurons that you find in that cerebral cortex. And um, what you see and what, you, what you're looking at here is each species, each, each data point is the number for one species of, of mammal. What you see is that, well, first thing, there is not one single relationship. There is not one way of putting a cortex of, uh, together. There's at least two. There's one that applies to primates here in red, and you see that humans are just on the mark. You can draw a line here, and you see that humans fall right there where you would expect the, uh, a large, a generic large primate cortex to fall in number of neurons. And so there's that one relationship that applies to primates, and there's that other relationship that applies to everybody else. Um, what does that mean, that there's two different relationships? Well, in practical terms, take a horizontal line here, and you see that when you compare a primate to a non-primate cortex, you find that the primate cortex always has more neurons than the non-primate cortex. And the bigger the size of the cortex that you're looking at, the bigger this difference will be, to the point where we're even our cortex is even smaller than an elephant cortex, but like I said, has three times as many neurons. Um, so what's happening here, if you describe it mathematically, is that while the relationship for primates is essentially linear, meaning if you have a primate with 10 times as many neurons in the cortex, you've just found yourself a 10 times bigger <laughs> cortex. The relationship for other mammals has an exponent of about 1.5. So if you get 10, if you're not a primate and you have 10 times more neurons, you've just gotten yourself a cortex that's about 45 times larger. So it's a very inflationary way of putting a cortex together. Um, you could, you see how you could uh, try very hard to apply the logic of natural selection or adaptation to explain how advantageous it could be to other animals, to non-primates, to have a cortex that becomes so large so fast. But uh, frankly, I think that we'll be pushing it. The, what makes the difference is that if you're not a primate, the more neurons that you have in your cortex, the lower the density gets exactly as expected. So given that the density of the other cells remains constant, this implies mathematically that the average neuron becomes bigger as neurons become more numerous in the non-primate cortex. But if you look at primates, it looks like um, this relation, the, the, the density varies quite a bit, but it's either non-systematic or else there's a very, very slight decrease in densities as primates get more neurons. Now, um, you see that uh, these, these lines uh, essentially intersect at some point here, which is interesting because we can use this um, modern diversity, this diversity in modern extant life, to make inferences about brain evolution, about really the story of, of brain evolution. And starting from what we know to be the first mammals, tiny little creatures with tiny little brains and tiny little cortices, we, if we can um, infer that if these rules here apply to all these species in green alive today, it's the parsimonious thing to do is to presume that all well, these probably, this is probably how the very early cortices, mammalian cortices, were built, which means that you can just regress this line here to some point in the past when the, the smallest number of neurons existed, and you can predict then that that very early mammal lived somewhere around here. And as new species appeared with more neurons, the brain, the cortex expanded as the average neuron became bigger, except when this radiation Appeared, something changed that uncoupled uh, the average size of the neurons from how many neurons you have. So that uncoupled one mechanism from the other. What about birds? Well, birds actually put mammals to shame. So this is the same relationship that I just showed you, but now I've added birds here as the black data points. So you see, if you pull a horizontal line, 
you see that uh, in the, the bird telencephalon, they're for a similar mass, there always are more neurons in the bird telencephalon than in the corresponding cortex of any mammal, including primates. And that is because the density of neurons in the bird telencephalon is not only very, very high, these are tiny little neurons, it stays high even as the number of neurons increases. So there's what you see here is there that's at the very least at this point, there's a primate way of building a cortex, there's a non-primate mammalian way of building the cortical volume, and then there's the bird way of building their version of a cortex, which is the, the pallium. Even more, the relationship between these numbers and what happens with the body, the size of the body, turns out to be much, much more diverse than you would suspect from just looking at brain mass. So previously, this is one of the few types of data that were available. You could look at the size of the brain and how it varied with the size of the body and you see that, yeah, there's, there's a fairly nice, there's a fairly neat correlation here. The bigger an animal is, the more neurons it, and the, the, the larger its brain is. And you don't really see any um, major difference between, at the very least, birds and primates. They all seem to be at the top of this cloud distribution here. But once you have actual numbers of neurons to look at, then you realize that there is much more diversity than literally meets the eye. Say you take a one kilogram animal here, take a one kilogram non-primate mammal, take a one kilogram primate, take a one kilogram bird, either a parrot or uh, a crow. What you find is that the bird systematically has more numbers than the primate in the cortex, which systematically has more neurons in the cortex than anybody else, all for the same body mass. Um, Another way to illustrate that is that um, meet my dog, Archibald. Archibald is a Great Dane. He's um, just one year old now. He's bigger than this already. He's at this point about the size um, that I am. And he doesn't have as many neurons as I am. His cortex is about one-tenth the size of mine. And by our estimates, dogs have something around half a billion, maybe a little bit more, but under one billion neurons, we have 16 billion in the cortex. And still, he does just fine. Um, we can look at the number of neurons in the, in the rest of the brain, in the spinal cord, in the, those brain stem structures that you could argue, well, those are the ones that really matter, and those are the ones that should really come in large numbers, commensurate with the size of the body. It turns out, if you do that, that uh, as the size of the body varies, and I'm showing you here a bunch of primates and um, also a, a mouse thrown in for comparison, you see that uh, the size of the body varies here a thousand times across these primate species, two, two and a half thousand if you, if you include the, the mouse. The, here's what happens to the mass of the spinal cord. It's a fair range of variation, but if you look at actual numbers of neurons, you see that there's only a tenfold increase in number of neurons. So let me say that again. A thousand times bigger primate body is run by only ten times more uh, neurons. So you have, what you have is a disproportionality in, in numbers here. Um, you can, and actually, you have these quite similar numbers across uh, marsupials and um, primates if you look at the relationship between numbers of neurons and how the size of the body scales. The, so it's very slow scaling, and you see that uh, for a very large variation in the size of the body, there's a very small variation in the number of neurons. We turned our attention to crocodiles to examine the case where an, an animal the individual animal gets, goes from being small to being gigantic over its, um, its lifetime. The question there, does a larger animal need more neurons? So we looked at uh, 1.5 kilogram animals to mid-sized animals, about 20 kilos. Um, this was a 40 kilogram animal 
And this is the largest that uh, we looked at, uh, so a thousand-fold variation in the size of the, the body. The original plan was to look up to 200 kilograms, but Paul thankfully decided that this was getting dangerous enough already, so was it okay to stop at 90 kilos? And I said, yes, Paul, please stop. Um, and this is what you see. For a thousand-fold <coughs> variation in the size of the body, you do get bigger brains, but you don't actually get more neurons in the rest of the brain, in the brain stem that actually runs the body. Actually, if you compare this to any mammal, this is fewer neurons than you find in that rest of the brain of any mammal. A large crocodile is operated, it's run by fewer neurons than a much smaller mouse or rat body. Um, not only that, but the scaling is not universal across um, across species. You, you see again for that uh, that for a, a one body mass, there are multiple possibilities of numbers of neurons in the rest of the brain that can accompany that. You see that uh, the elephant body is much larger than ours, but it's run with about as many neurons in that um, in that rest of the brain. If you look at the cortex only, there's multiple ways of putting that cortex in the, in the brain. So you see that larger brains do have a relatively larger um, cortex. And some clades do have relatively more neurons in that cortex. But um, there's enormous variation. And if you look at the relationship between numbers of neurons in the cortex and in the cerebellum, what you, what you realize is that there's, there's, um, there's, here yes, there's one very tidy relationship, but even though the cerebral cortex can become very large in relative terms, it always has a fairly constant 15 to 25% of all the, of all the neurons. Now, um, there's even more diversity than that, even though I told you that there are two ways to build a cortex, the cortical volume with, with neurons. If you take that volume and look at how it's composed in three dimensions, so if you break down that volume into surface area and thickness, you realize that there's each clade has its own way of putting a cortex together. There's multiple, you can take a similar volume and arrange it and uh, think of the, you can think of that cortex as um, jam, pretty much, that you're spreading on top of a cracker. Think of that jam as the, the, the volume that's composed of the fruit is the neurons, and the volume is composed of a certain number of fruit of a certain size. You can take that same scoop, so you can take that same volume, and you can, you can spread it very thinly over a large surface area, or you can spread it very little, but thickly over a much smaller um, sort of cortical area. And that's what uh, I'll propose is the our jam and cracker model of um, expanding cortices. Is that is that cortical expansion um, a, a universal function of the number of neurons? Turns out, no, it isn't. If you look. Once you have actual data, you realize that uh, a monkey cortex has 10 times as many neurons as the pet cortex, but both are equally folded. So you do not need fold more folding to fit more neurons. Also, having more neurons does not necessarily cause more, more folding. Our cortex has more neurons than the elephant, but it's less folded than the elephant cortex. So, how does this folding come about? This part can actually be explained neatly by pure physics. Um, so we found that the, the physics of an expanding, self-avoiding surface under uneven pressures, which is pretty much what you have in, as the cortex grows in, um, in development, it can be captured by a quite simple equation. And once we use that equation to, um, to analyze, here. once we use that equation to analyze folding um, um, across different mammalian species, you get 
a nearly perfect relationship, which is just what you would just what you would expect. So this is what we propose, that faulting occurs naturally. It's not a selected uh, for feature, it's pure physics. It will happen simply based on or depending on the combination of surface area and thickness of the cortex as it expands, as it settles in that conformation that has that's the most stable, that has the minimal effective free energy. Um, Turns out, this is in, in the works, we're just preparing this for submission. The same thing applies to the cerebellum. You can also explain the amount of folding that you find in the cerebellum with this simple physics uh, um, equation based on physics. Even as the spatial pattern of folding is completely different de um, de on, depending on the, on the plate. Now, one interesting consequence of that folding is that it's the same equation actually also explains the relationship between the volumes of white and gray matter, which if you, um, even if you take Zanga and, and Sejnovsky's original data set, you break that down by clade, you see that you actually do have different relationships by clade. Um, but again, once you take the physics into consideration, meaning once you take the thickness of the cortex and the different combinations of cortical thickness and surface area into consideration, you do find, again, one universal relationship, which, by the way, is far from what you would um, expect to be the optimized configuration of the cortex. So essentially what I've shown you is that um, the same body size can come with a very wide range of numbers of neurons, which means that a larger body does not require more neurons. Maybe a larger body allows for a number, a higher number of neurons to find targets for them in development and therefore to simply be sustained or to uh, exist and be maintained in development. Um, I've showed you that normal size estimated from normal density may or may not increase together with the number of neurons in the cortex. So that the consequence is that a same cortical size can actually be formed by or contained, contain a wide range of numbers of neurons. There is also this dissociable regulation of the number of neurons into thickness and surface area, which, by the way, means that the number of neurons under a surface area is not constant across species. It's not constant even within the species. We've shown that as well. There's wide variation across sites in the same cortex, and that is very likely to have consequences for function as you compare functional areas across species or even across different parts of the same cortex that have a similar surface area but actually have different numbers of neurons, not only total numbers of neurons, but have different numbers of neurons building each computational column. And even more important, you can have that same number of neurons be distributed as different combinations of surface area and thickness, which will, by pure physics, give you different, different degrees of, of cortex that is folded to different degrees, that has a different but still highly predictable combination of white and gray matter, which, by the way, are far from being optimized. Um, and I, let me stress here, I think the, the, the top evidence that you do not have optimization is that for a same volume, which is what we've always thought of as being optimized, for that same volume, you can have all these different combinations of numbers of neurons, of surface area, of uh, volume of the gray and white matter, all depending on the physics that uh, dictates what's the, the most stable conformation. You can even have cortices or palia that are made of many, many neurons that are not even organized in layers. You don't even find an organized, discrete white matter in a bird cortex or palia. Um, but they certainly function. They're doing fine. They do this amazing thing called flying that requires ridiculously fast computation, and we, we don't do that. Um, so I think once you, you put all that together, the, the, the one thing I can tell you is that 
there are many different ways of building brains. I don't see reasonable evidence that argues for any one of them being more adapted or less adapted than any other. Much to the contrary, what I believe is going on, um, has been going on in evolution for a very, very, very long time, is something much, much simpler. It's simply whatever works. Variation happens because biology is imperfect. Biological processes are never 100% effective nor 100% efficient. That means that errors will happen, which means that variation will happen. Um, and as long as the result is still viable, is still compatible with, with life, you're doing fine. Um, as the mice in my kitchen will tell me, by the way. So let me just use two more minutes to show you, okay, so what, what do we do with this, um, how could this variation um, appear? The, and by the way, there's the whole other part of the, so what, that there's this much variation. Please come Thursday and I'll tell you the rest of the story. There are some really cool things that happen, for instance, as you get more neurons in your cortex, and one of them is you get to be here, meaning you get to have enough time to do things that are much more interesting than just being out there and fending for your life and, and trying to keep yourself fed and um, happy all day. So, can, how can um, all this diversity be generated? It turns out, I'll give you just a, just a, a, a quick glimpse of the model that we're putting together, it turns out that there's a very, very, well, a, a, that you can model, you can capture all this diversity that I've shown you with a very simple model that uh, essentially describes, you have a, a free <coughs> variable here that's how many neurons you have, the other is how many, uh, what's the average size of the neurons, and the other variable is how that volume is spread into a certain surface area or, or thickness, just like what I, the, the jam and cracker idea that I told you about. Well, those three variables, number of neurons, average size of the neurons, and how that volume, the resulting volume is spread laterally, can actually be modeled into three variables as well that um, are two of which give you the total number of neurons. One is the number of symmetric divisions that you have in early cortical development that give you the total number of early progenitors. The other is the number of asymmetric divisions, the equivalent number of asymmetric divisions that you have in development. So how many neurons are generated by each of those founding progenitor cells. And the third variable is the average size of the neuron. What does the average neuron grow to become? So um, that's the, the biological basis. So the idea is, of course, that as you get more um, cell divisions, you get more neurons. And as you get more neurons, they may or may not become larger. Um, as you get more progenitor cells, you have an increase in surface area. And as you have more neurons generated by progenitor, you get more thickness. So here are our three variables. And there's the equation that describes how many um, neurons that combination will give you. Now, you can very um, easily rewrite all those variables of interest to us. Those are in, in uh, green. They're, they're the ones that we can measure. We can write them as functions of these three free variables, uh, or the three variables that we're postulating to be the free ones. And because you have three variables in all these equations, you can take any three equations, as long as they are independent from each other, you can take any three equations and solve for um, the, you can solve the system and predict all the variables that describe cortical um, diversity. And what you see here is that that works extremely well. We can predict from um, small, from just three measured parameters, we can predict using this model, this model all the, um, the, 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 the actual data within 10 or 15% or so, which across orders of magnitudes is, is really, really good. 
Um, and we can also predict cortical diversity as variation of these three free variables, which we can also calculate from the, for each species. And this is what we find to happen. This is the predicted average volume of the neuron in primate species in red, in the non-primate species in the, the other colors. And here's what you have, the, the relationship between the predicted number of symmetric divisions and the number of asymmetric divisions that could generate the cortices of each of these uh, clades. So you see that there is, there's order. There certainly are patterns that, that happen, but there, uh, with just three degrees of, of freedom, you can actually predictably give rise to all these 10 variables that I've shown you can be so diverse across structures. So when you put that together, um, what we have is this emerging view that brains are highly diverse, much more than we previously suspected. They do not at all seem to be optimized, but rather, I would say, constrained by physics. Um, so that what we have is really a, a scenario not in where everything is adapted for, there must be an explanation, a use, a function for every single thing. Or it's, it's instead, maybe it's simply, it's still good enough. It's whatever works. Variation happens as long as it doesn't compromise the whole uh, building, it's, everything is still fine. And of course, we have to remember that uh, that's all the more important because more of anything, including more neurons, comes with costs. There are energetic costs, there are time-related costs, and that's the other story that I'll tell on Thursday. So um, please come if you'd like to hear it. And I'll end here and just thank the many collaborators who made the bird tour possible, especially Pablo Nienic and Severino Lukas. And my longtime collaborators, John Taj, that's uh, we do all the primate work with. Bruno Mata is a um, physicist, now a, a professor at the university in, in Rio, and he collaborated closely. And Paul Manger is an Australian researcher in South Africa who likes to study several other aspects of diversity that uh, are complementary to my interests. So we've been happily working on all sorts of creatures, big and small. Thanks so much for your attention.